Welcome back. My guest now is Sir Patrick Moore. Over 50 years, Patrick has had a varied career in astronomy, which has led him to work with NASA. He is most credited for discovering the Eastern Sea on the Moon. Patrick is also the author of various books about the universe and presents The Sky at Night, which has just celebrated its 700th episode. Sir Patrick Moore now joins us via video link from his home in Selsey. Sir Patrick Moore, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. What sparked your interest, Patrick, in astronomy? Reading a book when I was just seven years old, a small blue book called The Story of the Solar System. It's on my mantelpiece over there. I read it through and I was hooked. Simple as that. Have there been any people who have influenced your work, would you say? Yes, several, I may say. <laughs> when I was very young, an old family friend, Lord Major Levine, A.E. Arthur Levine, he lived in South Yorkshire, in West Street, where I live now. I didn't live here then. I lived yeah. in Bognor. And um, he took me on and showed me his telescope and gave me my first views of the moon. And um, Jim Leans led me. And then, uh, when I was still a boy, proposed me for the British Astronomical Association. I was the youngest, youngest ever member then, so I joined up. So who's the most interesting person you've met? Uh, most interesting person I've met? I've got to say Einstein, haven't I? I met him when I was 17, training to be a navigator with the RAF. I was in the, in the United States and given the week's leave, and I met Einstein then. And exactly what I expected, charming, courteous, old-fashioned, Exactly, the Einstein you would imagine him to be. So I've got to give her, I've got to say Einstein. And what did you speak to Einstein about? I had a bit, two conversations with Berkeley. A little reception I was at, and a little reception after I was at. And this is rather a funny story. As you know, he was a, a very accomplished violinist. He had his violin with him, he'd been playing. So he played violin, said, I play with a swan. There was never coming to them. Saint-Saëns swan. There was a piano there, and I knew the accompaniment. They were, I've accompanied Einstein. Oh, for a tape. But there weren't any tapes in 1940. Would you class him as a scientific genius then, Patrick? Oh, yes. The greatest since Newton. I'm sure of that. No one like him. No one like him now. It'll be a long time before we get another Einstein. Just wait, we can't tell. <clears throat> and can the sky at night continue without you, Patrick? I certainly shan't be here, but I see no reason why the programme shouldn't be, because it, it's watched by about a million people at a time, and I think it's brought other people into astronomy, so I hope it'll go on. After all, I'm 88. I can't hope for many more years now, but I, I hope someone will take on from me and take it on from there. And what's your most memorable Sky at Night programme, Patrick? The one that's showing the first pictures from the other side of the moon, always turn away from us. They were Russian pictures, taken by a Russian probe, and they used my charts of the moon days to tie them up. And the pictures came through when they were actually on the air, the Russians sent them, and uh, I was on the air and said, look, in a minute now we'll see the first pictures of the far side of the moon. I don't know what they'll be like, but we'll wait and see. And here they come, and up they came from the moon tree. Okay, and regarding amateur astronomy, how do you see light pollution as a problem for uh, amateur astronomy? Light pollution now is a great problem for the amateur astronomy, and particularly over here in Britain, when even in some of our great observatories there have been problems there. But uh, I think it, it won't be it, it won't it will be ruinous. But the more we turn on our lights, the better. Now you met Edwin Hubble. Um, what sort of person was he like? Um, I was um, I mean, Edwin Hubble has a reputation for being aloof from distance. Well, I must say, I didn't find him that way. I met him when he was near the end of his career, and I was still young, but he was always very courteous to me. And I liked him very much, but well, I didn't know him well. Because he died before I was a fully mature, so to speak. Now, one of your friends was Arthur C. Clarke. What memories do you have of him? Oh, a great many. A great many memories I have. Of Arthur Clark, I have a great many memories. I first met him when I was 12, he was 17. We became lifelong friends. And uh, we've worked together on many occasions, although not until his last days 
did we actually write a book together? And that was what you wrote. Um, all proceeds going to that Garcia Tooth Army at the head of there. And we did that together. But um, we worked together on more occasions than I can count. Now, where is space research taking us with regards going back to the moon and eventually going to Mars? I wonder where space research is going to take us. Are we going to go back to the moon? Yes, I'm sure we will. We'll set up a lunar base. Just when depends, I think, partly upon finance and partly upon politics. We'll do it all right. Further than that, I don't know. Mars will flash further away, and the trouble there is radiation. We're going to be in space for weeks, exposed to dangerous radiations, and we haven't yet solved that problem. And so we do, Mars is out of reach. It'll come one day, but not yet. And do you believe that one of the reasons that we have not been back is because we only just made it to the moon, and even with today's technology, it would still be a, a struggle? Why haven't we been back here before now? Well, apart because um, there is now a collaboration between Britain and Russia, all the way, or Europe and Russia. But, um, of course, the Russians ran out of money, and money is essential. And you need the will to do it, and you need the collaboration of all the world's leaders. And looking around the present world's leaders inspires me with a feeling of no confidence at all. We've got to wait and see. Yeah, but what about people who argue about the cost of going into outer space? I mean, surely there are some benefits of going into outer space, such as medicine and technology. Space research is now linked with all other kinds of science, including medical research, and many lives have been saved by the equipment developed for use in space. Uh, and the lunar base will be of immense value in many ways. It'll happen all right, but I don't quite know when. And what's your opinion on life beyond the Earth? One question I always ask is, is there life beyond the Earth? My answer is, I'm quite sure there is, but I can't prove it yet. Look at it this way. Our galaxy contains 100,000 million stars, many of them with planets, so there are many Earths. And we can see a 1,000 million galaxies, and that's only part of them. And surely, we can't be the only living things. I don't believe that for a moment, but of course, uh, we can't prove it. And there's no proof yet of any life beyond the Earth. I think the clue may be Mars. Now, I don't mean Martians or little green men, but if we find any trace of life on Mars, and conclude it's not Earth contamination, then we know that life will appear where it can. And that'll be a pointer to the fact that there must be many, many Earths and much a great deal of life in the universe. But we'll know, we'll know, we'll know one day. What would it mean for mankind if we find life in the universe, Patrick? If we find life elsewhere, it'll alter all our thinking, won't it? We'll realize how unimportant we really are. It'll alter all our concepts, uh, even our religion. Well, it will be the biggest discovery we've ever made. And I'm sure that it will be made, but um, it may be that they'll contact us because we by, by radio. I don't think we had any visitors yet, and certainly flying saucers, no. <laughs> I'd love to think so. But I'm sure there is life out there, and I'd like to believe it. What about people who say it's dangerous to make contact? What would you say? I've heard people who say we should keep ourselves to ourselves, and it's dangerous to try and make contact. But I've got two answers to that. First of all, we've done it. We've been broadcasting now for a great many years, and our radio is our far the space. Secondly, any civilization advanced enough to come here is going to be far more advanced than we are, and we'll have left war far behind them. Remember the wise words of Percival Lowell, wrong about Mars, but about anything else, that war among us is a survival from savage ages. And the facts now the boyish, unthinking element of the nation. And beings who come here would be that far behind. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a bit worried. Okay. Uh, what are some of your key memories of the famous astronauts that you've met? I've met mostly... I have met many of the astronauts and all the lunar ones because I was on the um, uh, Lunar S uh, Survey Committee. And um, there are different kinds of people. In Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong are quite different. They share several things, though. More of them have a fair, their fair share of bravery, common sense, and improvisation. They've got that, but otherwise they're quite different. I mean, Neil Armstrong is an introvert, doesn't like being interviewed. Buzz Aldrin, in the best sense of the word, is a publicist, and you can go all that way. And the Russians are the same. Russian nationals are the same. 
And what excites you about the future of astronomy? I'm excited by the future of astronomy. I don't know so much about men exploration of space, but certainly unmanned research is going on at pace now. We know far more about the far reaches than we did only a few years ago. And uh, new information is coming in almost every day. What are your views on space tourism? I think tourism to the moon will come in the foreseeable future. And the horizon already started that, haven't they? Yeah. And I think that will happen. Further than that, I don't know. Just say, it all depends upon them what, how, how we get on with the radiation problem. Because we can't get to Mars until we solve that. And um, whether Mars too has really become possible, well, uh, what I say is, wait and see. And what does the universe mean to you, Patrick? I've always been fascinated by astronomy, and I've always been fascinated by the universe. It's so vast, we can't possibly have comprehended it. And ask how big the universe is, how old it is. Well, I can't answer those questions, and neither can Einstein. I know it was asked him. And Patrick, what would you want your legacy to be in astronomy? I've been in astronomy all my life. I try to do one thing, bring other people into it, and give a helping hand to those who are interested and those who are youngsters. And I hope I've done that. If I'm ever remembered for anything, it will be, it will be that. Well, I don't know. Others must judge. Well, Sir Patrick Moore, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to be here. For more information on any of my guests, visit my website, themoreshow.co.uk, and click on Past Guests. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter to get the latest updates on the shows. So until next time, thanks for watching.